good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the Australian Airports Association webinar on the diversification of airports through COVID-19. So my name's Scott Martin. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the Australian Airports Association, coming to you today from Ngunnawal Country in Canberra. So in today's webinar, the panel will discuss how airports have diversified their business in a time of change. This has been particularly important over the last year when the National Aviation Network was in a state of flux. In particular, we'll hear about the ways that airports have found opportunities in activities that complement the economic strength of their urban or rural region they're situated in, historic aviation uses, or the geographical location of their airport. One of today's lessons is the value that airports provide to their region's economic development and livability as an enabler of services such as police, firefighting uh, and aeromedical aviation, flight training, air freight or tourism. Another insight we'll hear about today is exploring some of the processes which airports can use to identify, prove up and deliver projects that help diversify their business in either aviation or non-aviation areas. So before we begin, uh, just a couple of quick reminders, some housekeeping things. This session is being recorded and we will send you a copy of the webinar, uh, of, of the recording, post the webinar. It will also be available on the AAA website. Also a reminder to please submit your questions using the question bar that you'll find in the GoToWebinar panel. Remember, there are no silly questions and we have allowed time for plenty of questions today. So please don't be shy. We really appreciate the interaction between the panelists and the attendees at the webinar. Finally, we want to hear from you, so please submit your feedback and or any webinar topics you would like to see in the rest of the 2021 webinar series. Now, it's time to introduce today's speakers. So first of all, is the moderator of today's panel discussion, the AAA's Chief Executive, Mr. James Goodwin, who is joining us today from Melbourne. So welcome, James. Thanks, Scott, good to be here. Thank you. And next we have joining us Craig Sinclair. Craig is the Economic Development Manager at the Tamora Shire Council. He's responsible for growing the local economy through the attraction of businesses, residents and tourists. The infrastructure at Tamora Airport is among the best in regional Australia, providing a home for the Tamora Aviation Museum and a number of recreational aviation events. So welcome to you, Craig. And next we have joining us is Daniel Jarosh, who is the Sydney Metro Airport CEO. Daniel has more than two decades of experience in private equity, real estate and investment management. He has worked with leading Australian institutions and he's an experienced real estate, airport and investment leader. So welcome to you, Daniel. Also joining us from Sydney Metro Airports is David Binskin. David is the General Manager Aviation at Sydney Metro Airports. He's responsible for the aviation operations of both Bankstown and Camden airports. Prior to being appointed to this role, David worked with Air Services Australia, leading both daily operational air traffic control requirements and overall organisational improvements. So welcome, David. Next, we have Greg Barrington. Greg is the airport manager at Bundaberg Regional Council. He caught the regional airport bud from the unique environment of Forest Airport in Western Australia, which led to his move in 2015 to Bundaberg Airport, where he is now the airport manager who wears many hats. So welcome, Greg. And good finally, to good to meet you. Finally, Justin Gordon. Justin is the managing director of plan performance and is a professional consultant with strong experience in live operational assets, having delivered aviation projects for more than seven years. Justin is well respected by peers and recognised by his clients for effective outcomes and going above and beyond to improve the effectiveness of airport assets and operations. So please uh, welcome our um, guests today and our moderator. So um, with, no, with, much, uh, with no more ado, James, over to you to um, get today's webinar underway. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you to everyone, and thank you to everyone online for joining us. Look, hopefully, um, I repeat what Scott says, um, hopefully we can have some lively discussion and debate, so you can type your questions in, but we'll have some question time as well uh, um, in uh, later in the hour. 
uh, on uh, some of the topics that have been discussed today. But look, diversification uh, is certainly an important uh, topic for all our airports at the, mo at the moment. We probably first saw this, the real diversification in the 1990s and early 2000s as those federally leased airports uh, started uh, really improving the infrastructure uh, on those uh, former Commonwealth uh, sites and aerodromes. But really what we're seeing with um, the different ownership models, uh, the different uh, operators of those aerodromes have different challenges about uh, how they can uh, uh, diversify and also specialise is also another point that we will discuss today. How do you specialise in an area where there might be in a region where there might be other uh, airports and aerodromes operating? So we've got a wide and diverse uh, range of people uh, on the uh, panel today. So. Look, let's uh, let's get into it, and I think we might start with um, with Craig from Tamora. So, um, certainly a very interesting uh, air, aerodrome um, up in Tamora. So, uh, rich aviation history, but we've in recent years certainly um, seen the move to um, the historic uh, aviation and uh, warbirds and um, the heritage flying GA flying schools and so on. So, um, Craig. How and why did the council decide that this was the area to diversify into? And uh, what have you learned from that experience? Well, I guess um, to start off with, if it was quite organic, um, there's been an airport at Tamora since 1920. Um, and soon after that, um, World War II broke out and uh, there was a pilot training academy set up there through the RAF. Um, so that was the, the biggest and the longest lived uh, Pilot Training Academy under the Empire Air Training Scheme um, and that um, sort of ceased in 1946 after the war. Um, so after that um, the, the, the airdrome at Tamora was really used for recreational aviation and um, for, for quite a number of years and, and built up a strong following particularly with um, gliding um, pursuits and it wasn't really until um, the late 90s when uh, David Lowy was um, looking for a place to um, you know, house a, a small collection of aircraft that he had, had, had started to acquire, um, that really the airport started to take an, a life of its own. Um, so um, Mr Lowy built a, a, a maintenance hangar and a facility out there to store his aircraft, um, soon decided to turn that into a museum um, and um, that's when council really started to look at the operations out there and see how they could start to build and diversify on that. So we um, we planned a, a small um, aircraft, sorry, um, air park estate, and um, that has then since grown alongside the museum as the museum's expanded and become more popular as a tourist attraction and attracted more um, aviation enthusiasts. And the community has grown around recreational aviation. It wasn't really until um, 2019 that um, Council invested in a master plan um, and by that stage the Air Park Estate had grown to quite a number of developments. There's now over 100 uh, Air Park Estate lots. Um, they sell quite quickly now and have become quite um, in high demand. So um, they've become quite a, a really harmonious relationship out there between um, what is the anchor tenant, the Aviation Museum, um, that relies on volunteers, a lot of whom live on the Air Park Estate and um, you know, dedicate their services in whatever way they, they can to the museum. Um, but we've really seen a, a really strong community of people grow around this common interest in aviation, living at the Air Park Estate um, from all uh, across the world and across Australia um, coming to live on, on the estate. Um, in more, more recently, um, you know, the need for council to um, to plug a hole in our operational budget. Um, it's about $300,000 that the, the airport costs us a year that's being subsidised by council, has made us sort of start to look at other means of generating income from the airport without really uh, impacting the general aviation usage that we've, that we've got out there. Yeah, I think this is one of the points of diversification, isn't it? That um, diversifying is one thing, but you still need that revenue base that uh, you don't want this to be uh, a cost burden um, if it can be. So what have you done there to try and uh, have the, the airfield um, be able to um, uh, be self-sufficient and, and not uh, and actually boost 
the, the regional tourism areas and the regional development area um, around Tamora. So there's a number of things that we do. We um, obviously support the museum in their events. So they have a, a biennial event called Warbirds Down Under that attracts over 20,000 people to Tamora. So um, that we support that event as a council by uh, assisting with the um, accommodation needs more than there's, there's more people than, than beds in Tamora when, when that event comes. So we provide um, the caravan park uh, services and, and take the revenue for that. We lease the runway out uh, to um, uh, to private individuals and organisations looking to test primarily um, speed car um, equipment. Um, we host a range of events or encourage events to, to utilise the airport, which may not always um, bring revenue to council, but it certainly justifies the investment uh, that council is making to the community because of the economic mm -hmm. impact that that has more broadly. We've implemented a um, um, air, airport maintenance levy um, that we um, levy to all landowners out on the air park estate. So that's a $400 a year levy that goes towards the maintenance of um, air, aircraft, air park um, facilities and, and taxiways, et cetera. And more recently, we're, we're looking to, uh, we're working with a, a pilot, commercial pilot training organisation to establish a, a pilot training school in Tamora, which will look at around 200 students training per year. Um, and um, the um, the landing fees uh, will help um, us plug the plug the gap um, in the major part. I understand you're doing a housing development now. That's very uh, interesting for airport land. So yeah, it's a it's a continuation expansion of the air park estate. So as I said before, we've got over 100 lots in um, what we've built at five stages of the air park over the last 20 years. Um, they were initially selling at between five and six um, lots a year. Um, now that's up to close to seven to ten lots a year. So the demand is is pretty strong, and that really picked up um, once we put that out with um, estate agents rather than trying to do the sales uh, ourselves, which we did in the in the early stages. So you know, um, and we've kind of got past the tipping point uh, now with um, the level of interest that's out there and the number of um, uh, residents that start you know advocating for um, for other within their networks to start living there too. So we're, um, we've got some funding from the state government to develop another 40 lots um, at the Air Park Estate that will um, essentially activate a whole bunch more land out there as well by the taxiway that we build to connect what was formerly um, sale yards land. So um, sale yards uh, starting to be consolidated into much bigger facilities in places like Yass. Um, so smaller, smaller ones in smaller towns like like Tamora are no longer required. So council owned that land and were able to um, repurpose it because of the proximity to the taxiway. I think that's an idea that many people um, on the on the webinar today might be interested in exploring. Do you think the diversification uh, projects that you've had over the last sort of 20 years or so has helped the airport and council through COVID? Would you have, are you better placed because of those decisions made sort of 20 years ago? We, did you cope through COVID better than what you might have done? Well, look, I'm not sure about COVID. I mean, um, COVID really didn't have a huge impact on Tamora. Um, uh, in fact, the impact that it had was positive, generally speaking. Um, what it has done has probably delayed some of the discussions we've had with the pilot training academies in terms of the impact it's had on their business. So that's probably delayed that. But on the whole, for regional communities like Tamora, COVID's been quite a positive thing. We were largely unaffected, but um, tourism has certainly picked up. The way in which people shop locally has, has um, improved. Um, what it has done is help us through other uh, adverse, adverse times like droughts. Um, so the millennial drought, um, when a lot of um, builders in other towns and communities um, sort of ceased operations or moved somewhere else, um, the air park estate construction really helped builders in Tamora um, stay through that. So now uh, we're more resilient uh, and have a lot more, um, a, a stronger trade space um, to help us through this growth period. So we've got over 30 builders and building firms in Tamora, which um, is quite uncommon and unusual compared to our neighbours who, who are similar sizes and lost their builders through that drought. That's really good. I understand you've got some slides, haven't you, to help people on the on the webinar just to get the latest I can, of yeah. So I, I can um, if I can start showing those now. I will.
what I wanted to do is just talk you through, can you see those now? Yes. Just talk you through um, some of the developments so that are here. I'll, I'll flick through it pretty quickly because I just thought it was good to show how it's changed over time. So you can see here what it looked like in the mid 1940s when um, there was a pilot training academy here. Over uh, 10,000 personnel, two and a half thousand pilots were trained here. So it was quite a large um, facility. It ended up moving to Wagga and becoming the rough base in Wagga. And this is a blurry image, but what this shows you is the, the first satellite image we have from Google Earth back in 1985. And you can sort of start to make out some of the, um, the infrastructure that is there, including one of the Bellman hangars that was left over from, from the war. Um, and then you can start to see how other infrastructure has been built over time, including the um, 0523 runway, um, caravan park that council put in to um, both facilities to support the aviation museum. Um, and you can see the Aviation Museum actually has, has been um, built by that stage in the first stage of um, the Air Park Estate. By the time we get to 2006, we've got some um, further aprons being expanded in for um, the Air Park Estate expansion, uh, the next stage of that, um, and um, the expansion of the museum to cater for the larger, um, more popular events that they're having there. By 2013, um, We've expanded the caravan park and we included some um, tourist accommodation there that council runs. And then 2015, we then look at the next part of the Air Park Estate, which is Airport Street. Um, Airport Street further develops there. We've, we add an agricultural apron, so that's ways in which um, you know crop dusters and things can access the airport uh, or the trucks that are needed without the trucks having to um, come into the airport facility to stock them up. They can just go straight off the off the road uh, that connects that. The museum um, introduces Sky Lodge accommodation, so that's tourist accommodation uh, uh, that the museum runs. We start to clear the sale yards land as well to help prepare for the next stage of the air park to take those 40 lots that I was telling you about. And at this point, we do the master plan, which is a bit late in the game. Um, and then we get to uh, the most recent um, slide that I've got, it's is 2020. So that's um, the gliding club build their own purpose-built um, hangar on uh, on the air, on, um, on Spitfire Drive. And that um, enables them to rent some of those facilities out um, to people who are looking to for their gliders from around, around Australia. It's become a very, very popular business model. Um, and we start the construction of a parallel taxiway along um, 1836. So that will allow for the Commercial Pilot Training Academy to access both runways without using 1836 as a, as a taxiway. Um, so that we did through a $5.35 .5, 5 million uh, federal government fund under Building Better Regions. Um, we're also improving uh, drainage and going to resurface 1836 as well with that, with that money. So that's a project underway at the moment. Um, and then looking forward, this is the, the, the master plan that, in, that shows where the Pilot Training Academy will go and the future subdivision um, of those 40 lots. And you can see the land that's been activated by us, including that taxiway um, either side. So um, there's quite a few hectares of land there that we um, will provide for future um, uh, enablement of industry or future subdivision for um, pilot um, for aircraft, uh, air park estate land. So just some images showing, um, you know, the aviation museum and the, the volumes of people that we get uh, for warbirds war down under, um, the caravan park and tourist cabins there, and also um, there are some pictures of the air park estate and to see how that's, um, you know, just people have the house and hangar there, but it also provides for anything that's aviation related uh, industry there, part of the, the um, DCP. Thanks, Craig. No, it's very. You know, we'll come back to some of those, uh, some of those points in uh, in question time. But um, when the people talk about having a, a big shed, or a you know a man cave, actually having your um, aircraft um, just in the back shed is is an interesting concept, isn't it? Um, one that I think we'd all like. Yeah. So we might move to Greg now. Um, Bundaberg uh, Regional Airport and Bundaberg, it's owned by um, Bundaberg Regional um, Council, um, serviced by Qantas Link, uh, Royal Flying Doctor Service, Lifeline, a number of charter operators and and flying training organisations. And last year, um, six million dollar air and medical facility 
uh, opened at Bundaberg Airport servicing the Royal Flying Doctor Service and RACQ Life Flight. So, Greg, um, uh, some interesting times. Um, 2020, certainly with um, COVID, is a good opportunity to do those sort of infrastructure upgrades. How have you been able to leverage those existing sort of economic and infrastructure strengths uh, in the Bundaberg region? Interesting question. Come, you can come at it from a bunch of different directions. I, first thing I'd like to say is, although we're talking about diversification, I don't think you do diversification in a time of need. I think diversification is a, the product of um, an attitude. And when I got the job here, I was aware that we had a fairly large piece of infrastructure in fairly good shape and that it wasn't being worked very hard. We would have something like 20,000 aircraft movements here a year. Clearly, that would be a lot fewer than I think anybody else here because of, uh, of training and, and museum activities. But 20,000 sounds like a lot until you take it down to a, a day. And that means we've probably got five flights an hour. So you can see we've got, we've got a, a really quite lazy main runway, uh, which along with the terminal was upgraded 10 years ago. But thinking about what you've got to do when you you take up a position like this, is you've got to take a look, good, long, hard look at yourself and figure out where you've got absolute strengths and where you might have relative advantages. In our case, um, we've got the new the upgrade that was done 10 years ago, so we can take Code C aircraft and we've got decent um, pavement concession number, so heavy planes can land here. We've got plenty of land on and around the airport, which means that if somebody wants to build something here, we can accommodate them. And land outside the airport is cheap. When I moved here from WA, I couldn't believe that I was able to buy an acre 10 minutes from the city centre for $300,000. I shouldn't have said that, should I? Because everybody else would be coming now. Um, the final thing I'd say, uh, uh, looking at our intrinsic strengths, is that we, as an airport, are a small part of the council's business. The airport here has five employees. Uh, two and a half of those are outdoor and two and a half of those are indoor, which is why I say I have the many hats because a lot of what you might expect to find done at an airport all comes through the office and the two and a half of us who, who sit here. Now, then you move on to consider what the airports around us look like. You've got, we've got 100,000 people in the region. Harvey Bay, the next airport south, has got the same. Gladstone has got a few fewer than us, and they're a few k's north of us. However, they don't have land around them. So in theory, it's easier for me to look for things that might take real estate and be able to compete effectively with those airports. So in some ways, I think with the sort of things that we've done, you could actually compare us probably more with WellCamp, except for the freight and, and the international, which we don't have the infrastructure to do, and God help us, if we'd have to build it, it would be awful. Um, the other thing to say is that this is an ag agricultural economy. I think you may have heard of the global brands, the, 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 the rum and the, and the ginger beer, but really we're a fairly small regional town and you can, I think if you were to talk to people here, we're not really a destination like a Tamora or a Harvey Bay or somewhere like that. We're just a means to get from somewhere to somewhere else. Now, if you're in that position, you're looking at competing with road transport. We're 400 k's from Brisbane. I can hop onto the, into the car and be at Brisbane Airport in four hours' time. Very similar situation to Geraldton in WA, or I guess Mount Gambier in, in South Australia. Similar kind of distances where you're actually, you can't get too hooked on RPT because you recognize that there is a, it's, the thing is easily, easily substituted. Uh, give us a uh, fast rail up the east coast, and I think as an, as an RPT port, we're dead. So what that's meant we focused on other things, and in, in, in our case, it turned out to be driven by federal funding, uh, state government funding, and the co-location of the RFDS and life flight in a hangar. And so that made, they realized they could live together, and we had land, 
and so there was it was logical that they build the facility that was developed last year what have you learned from the that experience greg with um so many different organizations so many different funding streams uh what are you know what what are what are the lessons if you could if you could do it again uh how would you do it i think probably the same way i'd like to claim credit but flukes count uh, and what i would say what i've learned is the project managers on projects of the scale we're talking about because we're not just talking about the the, the, the rfds and life light base we had to build some new code seat taxiway um, and uh, to, to link into a, a development precinct which is where the the um the rfds and life light are based so we had two project managers and we managed to get them talking to each other and both the individuals concerned didn't seem to have too much ego. So I would say biggest lesson for me is look to a, look to a project manager and make sure that they are the right sort of person, otherwise scream and kick. Um, secondly, I would say that there are no winners unless we all win. We had a, we had an idea of how much land we wanted to give them to build their their base on, and in discussions with the architect, it turned out that were we to force them to sit on the footprint that we'd originally foreseen for them, they would end up being compromised and wouldn't be able to develop their own operations. So in fact, we have a little bit reduced the commercial potential of our our development in the, in the long term but have made it easier for our, our, our keystone tenants to, uh, to, to, to commit for the long term. Final thing I'd say, I guess, is that one thing leads to another. Once the LifeLight and the um, RFDS moved out of their old hangar, that gave us some space, which is now, oper which is now leased by Queensland Fire. Because we had the, the, the Code C infrastructure, Queensland's large air tanker was based at Underberg for this last season. Um, and by leasing that organization indirectly, the hangar for, the, for storage of their toys, we've cut, they're, they're kind of committed to come back for the next few years, which is, which, which is good for us. And I, that was a bit of an exercise in itself. I mean, we had to persuade them that not only could they fire up air track to fill up air tractors here they could fill up and, and build some infrastructure for a bigger aircraft and we'll see where that leads us to next maybe the military talisman saber came here a couple of years ago and they're coming again this year well, i think that's a good point too about diversification isn't it that um uh, when when one piece of the puzzle moves it opens up another opportunity as well and being ready and poised to be able to capitalize on that and have those those thoughts ready to go is, is a good point. So we'll come back to some of those. We'll move off to uh, uh, Bankstown and Camden Airports now. So we've got uh, Daniel and David are both going to uh, speak to us uh, about Bankstown Airport. As most of you probably know, Bankstown and um, well, well, Sydney Metro Airports, which is both Bankstown and Camden uh, airports, are certainly um, well placed in uh, uh, southwestern uh, Sydney. And uh, certainly in 2020, a major redevelopment uh, of the New South Wales Police Air Wing uh, facility opened at Bankstown Airport. And that's complementing the um, New South Wales Ambulance uh, helicopter base, which opened in 2017. But Bankstown Airport in particular also has a, a thriving business park with uh, about 150, 160 uh, tenants on site. So, certainly a, a good example already of diversification of uh, as greg sort of puts it what might have been perhaps a lazy um asset um a number of uh decades ago so um so probably firstly to you uh daniel what what are sort of some of the you sometimes opportunities come from circumstance don't they and perhaps the geographical location of um, particularly bankstown um and camden but particularly bankstown how do you how do you use those 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 gifts that might be given, such as geographical location? Yeah, thanks, James, and thanks, Scott, and the AAA um, members for the opportunity to talk to you today about um, sort of banks down and uh, and diversification and and where we are today and the opportunities moving forward. Um, 
Absolutely, um, Bankstown uh, is located um, in um, an area that is um, thriving. It's a metro location, so uh, we definitely have that asset. Uh, and uh, you know, diversification uh, is is many years in the making. Uh, and absolutely, once upon a time, Bankstown Airport was uh, a sleepy asset um, in terms of uh, the vacant land. A lot of that land has been has been activated. Um, now, but it was interesting um, to hear Greg talk about flukes and you know, um, sometimes diversification is achieved out of necessity, uh, a large vacancy, uh, Boeing relocating to Melbourne, um, you know, creating significant vacancy and, and uh, the owners at the time um, needing to, to um, address that vacancy from an income perspective. Uh, sometimes it's by design, um, new facilities, uh, business parks as you've talked about. Um, to grow the diversification of the income into into other non-aviation areas, um, but sometimes it's just by good fortune you know, as well. Um, so definitely uh, recognise that Bankstown Airport uh, has been fortunate through COVID uh, as a result of its legacy and its location, uh, 100%. Um, but um, what it does uh, demonstrate is that through the diversification um, comes resilience in difficult times. Um, so uh, we've been able to, to, to weather the COVID storm relatively well. Um, it's not without its pain, but, uh, but relatively well. And that is largely because of, of the diversification, absolutely, uh, but also the nature of the aviation operations that we have um, at Bankstown Airport, um, which um, is characterised by uh, a large component of emergency services. Um, and, uh, and those emergency services are essential services and were operating um, during COVID, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, we also have um, a component of industrial which is growing significantly uh, and that will put us in a significantly positive uh, place moving forward. So just to set the scene um, briefly, thanks for, for showing the slide here. Um, in terms of the location, uh, we are absolutely strategically located uh, within the inner ring of southwest Sydney, 25 kilometres uh, from the established uh, eastern seaboard city, Sydney CBD, uh, and we're south of the central city um, with Parramatta to Bankstown Airport at its spine. Uh, and we're at the gateway to the emerging um, Western Parklands uh, city, which includes uh, Western Sydney Airport under construction uh, and the related Aerotropolis. So strategically, uh, at a macro level, um, it, is, it is a great position to be in. Uh, uh, if I can move to the next slide, um, this slide is something that we market to our prospective um, users of our industrial uh, estates, particularly our new facilities uh, at the airport. Uh, and what it demonstrates um, is within those three cities, uh, and this area covers uh, all those three cities um, in parts or if not entirely, 45% uh, of Sydney's population is within a 30 minute drive of Bankstown Airport. Um, so uh, in terms of non-aviation, um, that presents a significant opportunity and, and, and Bankstown Airport um, does have um, significant tracts of vacant land, but also does have um, uh, an inefficient layout um, uh, from its legacy, its, its World War II um, history, uh, as well as the evolution over time um, with the users of the airport growing and, and developing their, their, their surrounds, but not necessarily strategically to try and um, use that, uh, that land uh, efficiently. So this is a significant uh, opportunity for us. And um, in terms of sweating the assets, the assets are being sweat. There's um, significant income being generated. There's new development happening. Um, but how do we move the airport forward? Um, we are uh, uh, we have uh, legacy assets, tired infrastructure. How do we move those assets forward for the benefit of general aviation more broadly? Um, and so that's really the challenge um, for us and, uh, and playing to our strengths is important um, to that. Um, just to sort of drill in more locally, if I can show a, a slide of the, of the airport itself um, in the next slide. Um, more locally, the airport is 300 hectares and you can see there there's a significant um, component of that is, uh, is vacant land um, surrounded by dense um, industrial um, uh, to the south, um, uh, residential to the immediate um, northeast and, and also par parks and public amenity 
out of the southwest and, and uh, an incredible location for a 300 hectare parcel of land within Metro Sydney. So um, Blind Freddy could, could do something with the land. <laughs> um, the, 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 the skill here is making sure that you um, really recognise the ecosystem um, and ensure that everything you do comes together in a cohesive manner as opposed to um, say in the past where tracts of land were sold um, to, to third parties and then they really turned in on themselves. So the challenge for us is now um, really um, setting the stage for the future uh, and, and significantly repositioning Bankstown Airport to be the uh, critical piece of infrastructure, but also a significant asset for uh, for um, Western Sydney as well, and for New South Wales in the context of an emergency services. Daniel, um, can I ask, um, do you think that the ownership um, model um, that you have, and this would be of interest to people on the webinar, particularly those maybe from um, council operated airports, having a superannuation uh, fund and uh, you're really an infrastructure uh, organisation running it, does that make it better or worse or easier? Is there a bit more of an innovative streak running through there to encourage and support you? Um, how do you find uh, that? Are you, uh, are you uh, encouraged and urged to get out and diversify and use the asset? Yeah, look, uh, super funds um, is, a, is a big industry uh, and there are there are different kinds of super funds. Um, we are we are owned by Aware Super, um, and Aware Super is one of the largest um, superannuation funds in the country. Um, it has uh, at its core um, a membership base that is um, uh, uh, essential, characterised by essential workers. Um, so uh, that includes um, uh, policemen and women, uh, fire service men and women, uh, nurses, um, uh, teachers. Uh, so this asset is absolutely aligned to that particular type of super fund and, and that's the reason um, why we are owned by Aware Super, um, in addition to the fact that we are an essential piece of uh, infrastructure in a growth corridor. Um, so uh, when you talk about super funds, it's about um, ensuring uh, in the context of this asset that, that we are aligned with uh, with the objectives of the superannuation fund and, and that's meant that um, all the aspects of growth, particularly emergency services, training, uh, and education, um, they they really do um, get uh, a focus uh, and can be looked at through through many different lenses um, in order to in order to move the asset forward. Um, but in particular, um, look at it from a total return perspective, but also a balanced scorecard uh, in terms of the community uh, and what we have to offer. So. Uh, you know, if we're doing industrial and industrial is um, uh, performing uh, very strongly, um, it's, it's um, you know, a, a focus of a superannuation fund that is aligned in that manner is to really ensure that, well, the users of that industrial, how do we position them? So I think undoubtedly um, the longer term view allows us really to reposition this asset, um, as, as I mentioned. No, very good. I want to go to David um, now, also from Bankstown and Camden. There, um, we saw on the slide there the geographical location, and looming uh, a bit further west is Western Sydney Airport. Uh, David, uh, your views on how will you interact with Western Sydney Airport, or or how will Sydney and New South Wales interact, and the world even uh, with that? Where are you reassessing? Uh, your place within um, the, the greater Sydney uh, airport space. Yeah, uh, thanks James and, and thanks for having me here today. Um, I, I use the term a lot, uh, the next adventure and uh, the Western Sydney airport uh, coming into the Sydney basin is our next adventure in the aviation community uh, here in New South Wales. Um, we know obviously it's a threat um, to flying training in the area but the practicality of it is that, uh, that it is the old training area uh, where they are going to establish Western Sydney Airport. We still have a lot of airspace, uh, uncontrolled airspace to the south and to the north uh, between us and the coastline that can be used. Um, it's You have to sit and, and talk with uh, our clients uh, here at Bankstown and Camden. Uh, they are very, very concerned uh, about uh, Western Sydney turning up. 
But when you sit down and uh, you explain to them that there's opportunities uh, to diversify their, their own flying training um, uh, schedules and uh, their lesson plans and things like that, and to reinvigorate, um, as uh, most people would know, that with um, having organisations on your flying, uh, sorry, on your uh, on your airports that have been around for a long time, a lot of them are still using business plans from the 80s and 90s. Uh, this is very much uh, an opportunity for uh, our uh, users of our airports to look at the future, to understand where things are going. We're lucky enough that, to be working uh, with the Department of Infrastructure. Um, we've met with them in Canberra a, a couple of times now. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to propose uh, and uh, put forward some airspace changes that uh, where everybody can work together. Uh, things like um, a new uh, flying training area to the south below the Holsworthy Weapons Range, um, another one to the north, north of Richmond's airspace, uh, a VFR lane uh, through uh, the basin between uh, Bankstown's airspace and uh, Western Sydney's airspace, uh, so VFR traffic can still move around the place. Uh, curved approach from the south uh, for IFR aircraft in bad weather, things like that. And the, the department have been very responsive to the information that's been put forward. Uh, so when you sit down and, and, and talk technical data um, with people that are using our airports, it, it's very calming to them to know that uh, that we're, we're there, we're, we're, we're in the fight with them uh, to make sure that uh, their businesses will, uh, will continue. But on the other hand, they're not investing in new aircraft or things like that until they actually physically see how it's going to be set up for the future. So everybody's waiting to diversify from their businesses physically with their new platforms. Yep. And David, how are you handling um, the, the social licence, the community impact? You can see certainly the slide on the screen, the, the urban encroachment and the suburbs there, whether it's um, aeronautical or whether it is freight movements, those uh, truck movements, whether it's the, even if it's a medical helicopter, we still, you know, they still create noise and uh, and some environmental concerns for some people. So how do you engage with the community to, to bring them along and support, uh, support the diversification uh, plans that you might have? The interesting part about that question, James, is COVID. Um, Air services uh, and their noise inquiry unit uh, are responsible for uh, noise complaints of aircraft that are airborne. Uh, due to COVID, they were working, the noise inquiry unit were working from home and they were only accepting uh, complaints or inquiries via, uh, via email uh, and they weren't actually on the phones because every, no one was in the office. Uh, we found a lot of people in the community were ringing us directly because they actually wanted to talk to a physical person about the issues that they were facing. And with COVID, uh, people would normally go to work Monday to Friday, they get a bit of respite from living near an airport and then come home, a couple of aircraft in the morning, a couple of aircraft in the afternoon, they're okay with that. But when they're at home seven days a week, uh, it kind of started to uh, grate a little bit on them, unfortunately. And uh, we were able to work with the community. It, it was a, an opportunity for us to, as, a, as an airport operator, to be able to engage with people that would not normally engage with us. And we're able to sit and discuss with them. We have uh, two ATRs that operate in and out of here through the middle of, uh, middle of the night. Um, and we were getting a couple of complaints initially until people started to understand why the ATRs uh, were, uh, were coming in and out here when they realised, oh, here's all the stuff that I was ordering on the internet because I couldn't go out. And this was actually your parcel turning up to the airport so Australia Post could deliver it for you. Um, so it was around the practicalities of that that we were working with the community to let them understand what our what our operations were. Yeah, no, very good point. Good to keep people involved and, and when they do understand a little bit more, they often become a little bit more accepting as well. I want to move to Justin now. Justin, um, look, appreciate your insights here on um, what is going to be the new normal. I think, you know, uh, even if we get post-COVID, and uh, RPT or GA uh, or even recreational aircraft um, movements start getting back to normal, what will the new normal number be? Um, so what's some advice perhaps for diversification, um, not only within aeronautical, but certainly other, other parts the, to be able to maximise and utilise the space that we might have at an aerodrome? Yeah, most definitely. Thank you, James. Um, so essentially what I, wanted to add around that and was touched on a little bit earlier is that diversification 
uh, it shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction. It should be a long-term strategy and it should be an integral part of your, your business continuity plan. Um, considering your assets and, and understanding why, as an organisation or an owner of an airport, you want to diversify or need to diversify, just to make sure that that strategy from the top down is adopted and, and aligned um, with all the business units uh, working towards the same goal in mind, essentially. So obviously post COVID, when, um, when things do return to normal, and I guess that's a point to note that COVID's not the first, um, uh, first event where, where we've seen a decline in passenger numbers, be it, you know, um, uh, our pre previous health issues in the past or the GFC, et cetera. So these, these things will become, uh, will, will, will occur again. And it's important to make sure that we have a, a, a keen eye on how we've diversified our operations to remain current into the future. Yeah. And Justin, when pl good planning obviously is is uh, is part of this strategic plans, master plans. How do we how do we make sure that we have that room and that flexibility for uh, diversifying um, airport land usage at a later point? We don't we don't have a crystal ball. But what's your advice for trying to embed in master plans um, that flexibility uh, for something uh, like COVID or um, just to um, build us up so that we could cope through something for, like COVID? Yeah, definitely. So the, um, uh, the point is not to just consider those big ticket items. Sure, they're important to the master plan. Um, but also understand that if there's short term initiatives that help you diversify, um, they need to be aligned to the long-term strategy. So when building your master plans, understanding uh, what your purpose is uh, for an airport and, and how you're going to uh, diversify your revenues and incorporating it into that journey. As mentioned um, by Daniel and David, there was a long-term vision adopted in that approach and maybe short-term short um, initiatives uh, need to be at the sacrifice of long-term gains, essentially. So I guess the, the biggest advice there is to have uh, a strong hold on, on where it is that you want to be in the future and continuing to review that as you go along, as well as, um, as, well as understanding global, um, uh, global improvements with our, with our uh, society. So be it through e-health, how, uh, how is um, how is the health landscape changing? How is the RF RFDS starting to adapt and, and utilise regional airports for developing their e-health arms? Uh, how do you engage with the community better, as you touched on before? How do you start to leverage that, that opportunity to, to partner with your community and to become one, essentially, with the community to, to, to essentially grow revenue streams out of the land that you do have and, and invite them into your your asset as opposed to just being the neighbour down the road that nobody likes. Yeah, that's good. Now, I might invite anyone with any questions um, to uh, to start sending those through, either to uh, write them in the uh, in the question box and we'll come to those. But a question to all the panel, and um, with co what we've been talking about diversification, but we need to also understand and recognise the entire economy has been affected by COVID, that many of those businesses or organisations that you might have been dealing with um, uh, prior to COVID either might be in different circumstances, might have changed their own business models, may no longer want to take that, uh, uh, that factory or that tenancy uh, on airport land. So, um, has anyone got any examples or situations where that has changed, that the external environment, the non-airport environment, has actually impacted uh, their diversification plans. Daniel, you're nodding. Can you think of uh, something? Uh, it's an interesting uh, sort of question externally, um, how it's impacted um, the plans um, of, the, of the airport. Um, we we definitely have a focus um, through COVID on supporting our existing tenants. We have a diverse tenant base. Um, so it, I think it's probably one of a, almost a lost opportunity. We've got people at home um, working from home. Um, 
complaining about the noise potentially, as David has mentioned, or have been complaining about the noise at, at a sort of a level. But until when you point out that it is emergency services, there's sort of a, a level of sympathy and actually interest and curiosity about it. Um, but uh, but you know the absence of amenity at Bankstown Airport with that entire residential community to the north. So it's probably more one of a a positive there, James. But uh, you know our focus is absolutely on a, on introducing amenity for the community, bringing the community in, um, getting that critical mass to then be able to uh, provide that amenity also to our aviation operators, our customers that have to go off site for um, you know the most basic of amenities. So that's definitely on our horizon. So I think that might not have answered your question directly, but it, it, it made me think how is the external environment around us um, impacted how we perform. Um, regular passenger transport is not a big feature uh, of what we do. So uh, it's not like um, that was a significant consequence, um, but training schools definitely, um, so incredible resilience, um, their ability to pause, shut up effectively um, initially, and then reinvent themselves. Um, and I think what we're seeing is um, that there are uh, quite a few of those training organisations that are now really stepping it up. It's caused them to look at their business models. How can we be more efficient? What are the actual opportunities? Um, particularly if, if one training school may no longer be around, um, what are those opportunities for us? So I think in the main, uh, you know, they say don't waste a good crisis, right? So I think that's probably the message. Yeah, I'll probably add a couple of points there that um, if I may. Go on, Justin. Um, that in the changing landscape of you know the external clients reluctant to take on long-term leases, um, there's definitely opportunity to leverage you know, new tech startups, new new technology, be it through drones and trials and autonomous vehicles. It's how we as airports nationally, um, so leveraging that opportunity for for a trial basis essentially, be it short-term leases, use it, be it through the use of uh, redundant hangers, be it redundant aprons, um, how are we supporting the, the global trends um, and having and leveraging the assets that we already have for short-term opportunities as opposed to locking yeah, it's, them up. That's a good point Justin and a lot of those startups won't necessarily need uh, um, big or brand new facilities um, taking over, as you say, some existing um, tenancies and hangars and things, um, even if it is a short-term lease, might be just using that asset that is already there of no real cost uh, to upgrade for the, the airport. So yes, although everyone wants that big name um, uh, organisation uh, to be there on site, um, not forgetting some of those smaller opportunities as well. Greg, I was going to ask you, obviously regional communities face um, crises um, from time to time, um, droughts, floods, cyclones. So, um, you know, perhaps um, weathering the storm, to excuse the pun a bit, um, <laughs> regional communities, are they sort of better placed uh, to, uh, to be, you know, prepared for those changing environments in those regions than you know, perhaps some of the, uh, the the capital city airports, for instance, uh, um, suffering the effects of COVID now. Well, I think that's that's an interesting point. Um, certainly, there's a difference between capital city airports and regional airports. Um, we are council owned, therefore, the return to the community isn't necessarily financial. C Craig said something about that, 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 which which would be. Um, which would also be true for Bundaberg. So if we, as long as we're covering our costs, and fortunately we still, even with our RPT at similar levels to Sydney, sort of half of pre-COVID, um, we're still covering our basic operating costs. But because people receive the emergency services and government aircraft coming in and the flight training going on, we kind of, we're kind of left alone a bit. And I've also said we're a small part of council's business. Five of us compared to, I think it's 800 people the council employs. So, you know, we are, to quote a foreign German colleague of mine, uh, just a fly shit, uh, you know, a, a, a wart on, a, on the football. So that gives us, uh, as an airport, a, a, chance, a chance to survive fairly well. There's also another strength, I think, 
which would probably be true of airports of a similar size to Bundaberg, which is that if you're in a capital city airport and you've got a million people and you're the chief executive and suddenly revenues drop through the floor, you're into the business of chucking people out. That's a, I could argue that's a scale effect in reverse. If you chuck any of our people out, we can't keep the airport open, which, yeah. which is a good place to be sitting. Yeah, that's good. I want to go, we're, we're fast uh, running out of time. I want to just go to everyone on the panel here, a bit of a big picture question to sort of wrap up. I mean, how confident are we for the future? Um, we've got an aviation issues paper uh, that the government is looking at now. Um, what's the next big thing? We've seen airports diversify into things like the retail, the bulky goods, outlets, uh, training schools, uh, museums. Um, you know, what, what's next? We have to be mindful that we uh, we need to know what's coming next and reading the room and reading the marketplace. Um, so I think sort of two questions in one there. It's um, any thoughts on the next big thing uh, that we all should be looking towards uh, and how confident are we for the, the future of, uh, of airports? Maybe, um, David, you're the first on my screen. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, but my opinion is the, the and probably the same as most people that are, are listening in at the moment, the autonomous vehicles uh, is a big one for us all to watch. Uh, and it's something that we're looking at and uh, trying to prepare where we can uh, for that phase of uh, the aviation industry. Uh, trying to, you know, what does an autonomous aviation base actually look like? How can it integrate with your, your current setup? Would it work with controlled airspace? All that type of stuff. But that's, a, that's a big one for us. Yeah, very good. Greg? I would have nothing to add to that. Uh, typical MBA, I can make more candles more cheaply. <laughs> but seeing the future is kind of tough. And that, that's fine as well, isn't it? Yeah. Daniel? Um, I'm going to uh, sort of go the, the sort of macro um, answer, which is around um, ESG and communities and airports being more than just airports. Um, I think, you know, there's a significant emphasis, obviously, on, on and, and momentum on climate change. Um, obviously, as airports, we have a, we have a footprint. Um, I think um, you know how we respond to that um, could um, be a fantastic opportunity for airports to be leaders um, in in this space, um, uh, as opposed to followers or unwilling participants. So um, you know we work, um, we have our own assets, we have our, our our clients and our customers' assets, the airlines. Uh, you know how we bring that together uh, and what we deliver to the community can be quite powerful. Uh, and, and that's something that definitely for uh, for banks down in Camden, we are absolutely focused on as a potential point of differentiation and engagement. Thanks, Daniel. Justin? Um, I would go down the route of um, the digitalization and advancements in technology, similar to automation. Um, I think there are growing pressures on our health system to uh, to find more efficient uses of their existing land. And maybe that means um, geographically spreading, going back to a more dispersed model um, and aligning um, uh, the infrastructure with, with, the, with, with the location of which they need to service and be it through air transport and quicker response to emergencies. Um, and then advancement in technologies, definitely uh, centralization of either data hubs or or again, trialling of new technologies is one which I think airports can position strongly for in the future. Yeah, very good thoughts. Craig, lucky last. Thank you. Um, I think there's a, there's a few things happening. Um, regional airports in, in smaller towns like Tamora and, and bigger regional centres are going to become more important, I think, as people can just tend towards people relocating from metro areas to the region uh, continues. Um, so I think you know we've seen this kind of trend in Europe before, and I think we're probably a bit behind the eight ball in terms of the love affair that we have with our countryside. And you know I, I lived overseas for quite some time and saw how that uh, impacted regional airports that were once in sleepy towns as tourism um, continues to expand and and people continue to move to those areas. So that'll become important. Also, you know the 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 impact on pilot training, the demand for commercial pilots. I think once international borders open, will 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 be 
you know, exponential um, in terms of that impact. And so, um, you know, look out for that and the impact that that then has on aircraft engineers and those related services and needing to train those up. Um, and then aerospace is, is again where um, we certainly have had quite a few inquiries uh, about, you know, those potential uses as well um, moving forward. And really that's something that's really difficult for us to get our heads space around because it's um, it seems so futuristic, but actually when you speak to the people that are operating in that in that area um, and the advancements that, are, that they're making, um, it's it's pretty realistic and um, and on the horizon pretty soon. So it'd be interesting to see what happens in that space. Good, thanks for that, Craig. Well, we're out of time now. It's been a very interesting discussion. Notice nobody mentioned that getting into quarantine uh, facilities might be uh, something for the future, but um, but but that's another one perhaps. Uh, I'd be able to assist the community uh, where we need to. But look, uh, uh, just a bit of a wrap up. I think, look, everyone um, utilising your strengths is what I took from this, that um, every airport is going to be different. You've got ge different geographical locations, different regional uh, opportunities. Um, but also, I think, as everybody has said, um, that this is not just something you do in times of need or times of crisis. There needs to be planning for this and constantly reviewing what that diversification uh, strategy uh, might be. Um, as David put it, uh, involving the community is also important to make sure that uh, uh, the community is involved, uh, um, politicians are involved and, and so on, and that uh, any of these should not be uh, knee-jerk reactions. So look, really interesting discussion. Appreciate everybody's input here. There's been sort of more than 40 people join us, so that's, uh, that's a really good show for um, uh, for a 11 a.m. webinar. So I appreciate everybody's time and interest on that. So Scott, I might hand back to you as the, the host and um, thank you to everyone on the panel. Lovely, thank you very much, James. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, it was a great webinar. I think one of the best ones this year. Um, personally, as someone that likes to look at the longer view of things around airports and aviation, I think there was some great discussion today about the longer term outlook and prospects and the need for airports to always be looking just that little bit over the horizon to see what's coming. So thank you all again for your being here today and uh, to James for setting some great questions to our panellists. So yes, and thank you to everyone else who attended. Uh, it was a well-supported webinar today and the AAA greatly appreciates your support. Just a reminder that today's webinar recording will be available on the AAA website and emailed to all attendees once it's available. Um, I'd also encourage you to provide feedback on any other topics you would like to see covered in the 2021 webinar series. Please email the, the, uh, the events team at events at airports.asn.au. And finally, a reminder about the upcoming Pavements and Lighting Forum in May. Partnership and, ex and exhibition booths are selling quickly. Limited booths remain. Please email events at airports.asn.au if you are interested in showcasing your products or services. Registrations to attend are also still open, so please ensure you secure your place today. Again, Thank you to our participants. Thank you to James for being our moderator today. And thank you to the attendees for being here today. Enjoy the remainder of your afternoon and the remainder of the week. Stay safe, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you online again soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.